search results. And then I'll tell you about um, some interesting power spectrum results and um, some interesting Planck results and then discuss some future prospects. Okay, so you've got our land to CDM component standard model. We've got the dark energy over here. We don't know what it is. And uh, here you see me and structure form. And we're going to be concentrating on galaxy clusters, which are constant hundreds to thousands of galaxies. Now, you know, we got this uh, lambda CDM model. You can measure the expansion rate using these different techniques, which were all standard rules. And that gave us our pie chart here of dark matter, dark energy, and everything we know over here. I'm going, to, I assume you all are uh, well familiar with all of that. So, the parameters I'm going to focus on are the W parameter and sigma A. So the reason why we're, we're motivated by this work is obviously because dark energy has a problem. If our lens CDM model that works so well suggests that dark energy is made of the vacuum of space. And if that's the case, then they'll use one of them. However, this doesn't work theoretically. I think there are some tight stumps on how to make this work. And there's even a very large time tuning problem if dark energy is really an energy of the vacuum. So if it was an energy of the vacuum, we would expect minus one. And sigma A is the measure of the structure of the universe. So one nice way to think of it is if this is the universe and you cut out these little ice cream scoop scoop spheres of the universe that are eight H inverse megaparsecs today, then you're measuring how clumpy the structure is in the universe today, how many clusters and galaxy clusters there are. And the clumpier the the structure is today, the larger the sigma A value is. So this value of sigma A is a measure of how much structure we have today and how big it is. And I focus on this parameter because it's going to be a particularly well-constrained one with the other techniques I'm going to describe in a little bit. Now, our expansion rate measures of W map, the baryon acoustic oscillations, and supernova have led us to this concordance picture where W is pretty close to minus one, and sigma A is, is landing now somewhere around this point of region. And so that's the expansion rate. And now uh, many people are motivated by trying to measure the growth of structures. The growth of structure is a completely independent way to measure cosmology. And uh, the reason why people are interested is because since dark energy is so difficult to explain theoretically as the vacuum energy of space, people have looked for alternatives, like maybe gravity is breaking down on the larger scales, maybe we have quintessence, etc. But lambda CDM makes a very definitive prediction of how structure grows throughout the universe. You know, basically says we expect this many clusters above this mass of this redshift, and that's it. So to first order, we're looking for some deviations of this, and that would suggest that our concordant model has some problem. Okay, and here's just an illustration of that, where we have two different models of general relativity, and this is a modified gravity DGT model, and both would give us the exact same cosmology with the expansion rate, but when you measure number of clusters as a function of redshift, you get differences. And so this is an example of the type of thing you would be looking for. Okay, so, so the modified gravity here could be more clusters, is that right? Mm -hmm. okay, this is a model in dependent states. So this right. particular model gives you that. Some other model will give you something different. And it, it's, it's important to keep, I'll just add this, that um, any modification or dark energy theory other than the cosmological constant actually has more problems because there are additional fine tuning that you would have to explain. So, I mean, uh, the cosmological constant model has a lot of things going for it, and that is actually the simplest, but even that simple theory, you really can't explain it. Okay, so now what astronomers have identified is three, at least three major techniques to measure structure growth. So, weak lens in cosmic shear, redshift space distortions, and this one that I'm going to focus on cluster buttons. Now, there's been a lot of talk of these 
the source galaxies and the light is bent, they look at the correlations and the shapes of the galaxies. Uh, one problem is that most of these surveys just have photometric redshift, and, and that's a problem, they're not spectroscopic. Another problem is that galaxies can have intrinsic alignments. And the third problem, certainly for us as key, is that it's from the ground. And so, um, so that is a severe challenge in measuring the shapes. For redshift-based distortion, where you look at distortions in galaxy surveys, where you have spectroscopic redshifts of millions of galaxies, you're basically trying to use the fact that redshifts are measuring both velocity and distance. And essentially, if you have regions that are overdense, galaxies will fall towards them, and underdense regions will uh, expand away. So you look for distortions in the redshift space of the galaxies, but the largest systematic hurdle here is galaxy bias. So how are the galaxies tracing the dark matter halos? And that involves astrophysics, and galaxy bias is expected to be scale dependent, et cetera. So that's a, a, an astrophysical challenge here. Here, the largest source of uncertainty is when you're trying to count the clusters as a function of mass and redshift, how you measure the cluster mass. That's the largest source of uncertainty here. How you connect what you observe to cluster mass. Now, traditionally this has been done in X-ray and optical, although only with a handful of, of uh, analyses to date. Uh, and the difficulty with X-ray and optical surveys are that they're flux limited. So that means that when your cluster is farther away from you, you lose the signal. And that's a problem when you're trying to count how many galaxy clusters there are as a function of cosmic time, because you don't know if you're missing clusters because you don't see the signal anymore, because they're just not there. So now for the first time, we have the ability to actually find galaxy clusters in microwave mass. And this is a redshift independent technique, and that's its strength, because the CMB is serving as a backlay, and you can find all the galaxy clusters from the time of their first formation to now. So just to illustrate this, here's the primary microwave background at 13.7 billion years. Here's AP over here. The photons come from there to AP. In the way, um, there are other galaxies that have contaminating signals. And they emit primarily in radio and infrared, but they also have microwave emission. So that signal comes into the map. And then the microwave photons that hit the galaxy cluster and they upscatter those photons and make a unique signal and that comes into the map. But the point is because you have the backlight here, if you have a cluster of a certain density and temperature, it doesn't matter what redshift it's at, you'll get the same signal. So that's the whole strength of this effect. So of course we're talking about the SD effect. I'm sure you've seen these slides many times. Here's the microwave photon, it hit the hot gas. The photon energy gets upscattered, so here's the black body, and then here's the chip. And the frequency is below the null, you see the decrement, and here you see the increment. This is ABOL 2163. So it's a unique spectral signature in microwave background, nothing else looks like this. It's redshift independent. And to first order its amplitude is proportional to the cluster mass. And we indicate the SC plus by this Y parameter. Okay, so here, here's our progression of CMB experiments from COBE to 
primary CMDs fluctuating on larger scales than that. And so if you just filter the map for fluctuations on arsenic scale, these clusters and the point sources should pop right out. And so you can look for any decrements that are above, say, phi sigma, and you can look for any point sources that are above phi sigma, and, and you get your uh, sample of candidate clusters. And so there was a series of three papers that came out, Marriage et al., which describes the cluster sample, and then et al., which describes the optical and extra follow-up of all the clusters, and then the paper I read on the cosmological constraints. So here are little thumbnail pictures of all the clusters we found. Some are very well known, like the bullet and the ABLE cluster. Some are brand new. All of these have been confirmed in the optical. So basically, we get our candidates, but then we follow them up with four meter telescope in Chile. We confirm that they're clusters, and then we get their photos of these. They haven't already had a spectroscopic ratio. And in this table, what I'm showing you is our highest significance cluster. So there are, there are nine of these with a signal above 300 microcosm. So here is the app name, here is its position on the sky, and here is the signal in microcosm. So they're all above 300 microcosm here. And then here are the redshifts. And the thing to take from this plot is that all of the clusters, so here are the, here are the other names for the clusters that were found by some other technique. And all the clusters with a redshift of 0.5 were all discovered with ESP. This one at a redshift of 1 was first seen by SPT and followed up. That's why we have the spectroscopic redshift. And then it was seen in our maps as well. So I think even just looking at this table, you can see the power of the SC effect because you're essentially finding all the massive clusters but you're filling in this whole high redshift part of the sample. And these were all detected by actually an optical before. And then here are just some optical images of these high redshift clusters. So this is point five, at point 0.54, 0.71, 0.75, and this is at redshift one five. Can we just go back to the redshifts? Um, so, um, you know, I had a split brain. You know, one side was plank, the other side was act. And one of the plank points was that one of the uh, redshift determinations they felt was off, or I think it was the four. Okay, and how, how did if, if you, you know what the current status or statement is in the act thing? So, I think that's spectro, uh, not spectroscopic. Uh, this photo, this photo thing? Photo Z, right? What did they say and, it was? Well, um, uh, one. Um, what, 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 well, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was <laughs> Anyway, so it was down significantly. Uh, they made rather a big point of that. And uh, I probably think the point was correct. Did they use spectroscopic Okay. Yeah. I know also, I think one of these has shifted to maybe closer to 0.8 as well. So the uncertainties that I included, even though we had spectroscopic redshifts of a, of a number of these, in the analysis, I said that we had uncertainties of 0.1. So if this is 0.54 and now you're saying, well, you're saying it's 0.3, uh, that's maybe two signals. Remember, it was significantly different. Okay. And, uh, um, and, and, and so that was, uh, I just wondered if Felix had a... Felipe? Felipe, sorry. Had a, so, we would need had, to... Had a, had a comment that he had made in response. I okay. had followed him through the program. I, I asked him about it. Yeah. 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 So I will ask him about it. I hope that at least in the analysis, since I was pretty conservative and I said that all our uncertainties are 0.1, that um, I don't think it would have a big effect given, given all the other uncertainties I allowed for in this analysis. But absolutely, we need spectroscopic redshifts and everything. Yes. So now this slightly speaks to that. Um, this is the redshift distribution of that sample. So this is redshift. And this is that high significance sample number less than some redshift. And so this is the data, the step function. And the dash line is what you would have expected if you had a clean mass cutoff and you assumed lambda CDM. And this is the number of clusters you would have expected as a function of redshift. So the purpose of making this plot, this is not going into the cosmological analysis, but this 
which was just to see that a redshift distribution of our sample was making some rough sense, and wasn't, we weren't finding all clusters at 0.2 or something like that. And it sort of gives an indication that the SC effect is roughly a mass cut. Okay, but now to do the cosmology, what we needed to do was we needed to understand the completeness of our sample. We needed to know were we missing any clusters. And then the other thing we needed to do was we needed to relate SC signal to mass. So to first order, we tried to answer both of these questions with simulation. So what the simulations we used were uh, some simulations that helped uh, put together, and then we made these public on the Lambda site, which is the repository for the CMB data and the tools to now analyze the CMB data. And we made the primary CMB background, which was lensed by the structure in the simulation. And then we um, added other components like infrared sources, and there, well, it doesn't come out here, there were a few radio sources, the thermal SC and the kinetic SC. And once we had a simulation of the microwave background, we also had to simulate the experiment and the analysis procedure. And then doing that, uh, it seemed that clusters that had a signal of above 300 microcolon, we should be pretty roughly complete above that SC plus limit. Whereas below that, then we start to miss a lot of clusters. So that's the easier part of those two questions to answer. The hardest part, harder part, is to relate the SC signal to the mass. Okay, so here is SC signal with some redshift dependence folded in and mass. And these points are coming from those simulations. Uh, and actually, you can even see some hints of some curvature here. But to first order, you can do, you can plot down a line and call this your fiducial relation. Now, the question to ask is, why would you think these simulations are at all reliable? I mean, the whole name of the game is to model the gas and relate it to the mass. Now, these particular simulations, they're not hydrosins from first principles. They're simulations where the gas has been painted on to the dark matter halos. And that gas model was calibrated off um, X-ray operations. Actually, not these ones in particular, but you can see here, this is the pressure profile as a function of radius. Uh, for the clusters in the simulation, this is the black. That's the simulation with one and two signal air bars. And this is the match to the Armadadal x-ray data. So this, uh, this actually came out after the simulation. But it, the match is still quite good. But it's important to note that these simulations were calibrated off of massive clusters found at low redshift. And then the extrapolation was done to higher redshift Okay, the other thing that we did to try and see if this, if this fiducial model, uh, how we related the gas to the mass made any sense, was we took the nine clusters in our data, in the raw data mass and we stacked them. And that's this black line that we have here. That's the stacked signal from the nine clusters. And then this blue curve is doing the identical procedure with the simulation. And so now uh, we see that it, the simulations don't seem completely crazy. And we also did this by burying the gas model. And the way that you can bury the gas model is what's important to note is when you have X-ray observations or SC observations, you're measuring essentially the thermal gas pressure. And you can relate that to the mass. Because the first order, the thermal pressure of the gas should counteract gravitational pull on the gas, and that can be related to the mass. But if there's another source of pressure that you can't see in SC and X-ray, for example, some non-thermal pressure like bulk flows, then that can also add to this equation here, and your prescription for relating the thermal pressure to mass can be off. So when one way to vary the gas models is to either assume there's no non-thermal pressure at all, which is sort of like an adiabatic model, or you can assume there's a lot, like 20% of the pressure is a non-thermal pressure. And uh, this model, the adiabatic one still seems to be a fine fit. Uh, this one, the non-thermal one, seems not to fit very well. What do you mean by adiabatic in this context? It in this so many different ways. It, it essentially <laughs> just means we assume no 
concept isn't correct anyway because all of the entropy is coming from shock heating, which is stopping the non heating batting. Right. And that's what people do when right. they use the word heating batting. Yeah, I think I'm not an expert on the naming, but in this context, I think it just means no non thermal pressure. We, we, try, we try to banish uh, as much as we can the word adiabatic regarding hydrosyn. Yeah. And it says shock heating only, or okay. formation yeah. shock heating. Yeah. Like that. But I think, um, right, so this, in this context, I'm just meaning no non thermal pressure, and we know this is not right because we know there are sources of non thermal pressure. But it was basically, the point of these models was just to give a range of what we thought the allowed gas models could be, some sort of reasonable range. Now, now the first thing one can do if you're trying to constrain W and sigma A is you can say, well, what if we fix our relation to the judicial model? And that's, that's what's done here. So in this plot, this is W and sigma A. This is WMAP7 alone, the 1 and 2 sigma error bars, for this WCDM model. And so what that means is, is essentially lambda CDM, but now W is kept as a constant, but that constant value is allowed to vary away from 1, minus 1. So these are the WMAP7 constraints, and if you add those 9 out clusters, but you assume that this scaling relation between SC flux and mass is fixed, you get these constraints. The uncertainties that are in here are still a 26% scatter in that relation, 20% uncertainty in detecting the SC signal, and of course I'm assuming all my redshifts are over D with a 0.1 error on redshift. But, so I, I make this point and I, I get into trouble, but this is the, actually the first time we have such constraints from SC clusters where we've actually measured the signal of individual SC clusters and, and achieved these growth construction constraints. And the second point is, here are what the constraints are from WMAP7 VAO and supernova. Um, and it's consistent with the growth constraints. And also, you can see that if you did really understand this relation, then these constraints would be very competitive because um, you can reduce the uncertainties on your photo Ds, you can also reduce your uncertainty on measuring the SC signals. However, here is the point to take away from this plot. The largest source of uncertainty is this relation. And if I allow the parameters of this relation, so the scaling relation, I parameterize it with four free variables, a two power law indices and normalization and a scatter. And if I allow those four free parameters to be and just bound them by the range of these non-thermal and, and this other model uh, with no non-thermal pressure, then this is the constraint I get. So you can see how important it is to understand this source of systematic uncertainty and, and it's really limiting the constraints that you can get. Although I think we were quite conservative in allowing this large range here for these massive clusters. Okay. So now uh, let me okay. So now let me try and tie that into some interesting things that are going on with the power spectrum, and um, and then and this is Planck, and then I'll tell you about some future power spectrum. Okay. So here's the CMB power spectrum that we all know uh, very well. Here's W map, and here the key of act and SPT is now to be measuring these high L's. So just just to remind you, here is the CMB, and we're looking at fluctuations on different scales. This is large scale, low L, high scale, high L. And really now, for the first time, we're probing uh, high L all the way out to 10,000 here. And AF is actually measuring from 500 all the way to, to, to 10,000. And, um, and I actually realized, so this is a, an SPT paper, and I actually realized just recently, the act points are covered under by these other points with the larger shapes. So I 
solid green is our power spectrum at 145, 148. Then this is the cross power between 148 and 218, and then here is the power at 218. And here are the components that go into that. So here is the lens primary CMB, which then falls off at higher out. And then the other components at high out are these infrared sources I was telling you about that have microwave emission and also these radio sources that have microwave emission. And here there are the three different frequencies. And then the other component we're interested in is this SC signal. The power from the SC signal is really the power from the whole ensemble average of all the clusters over a large mass range and we're all richer. And um, you constrain this signal because you know that each of these other signals have a unique shape uh, in L space, and also they have a unique spectral dependence as you go from one frequency to the next. And so you use all that information to constrain the amplitude of this SC signal. And how this amplitude gives you a completely different way of measuring sigma A, other than the one I was telling you about before we use individual clusters. So it's a completely different handle on the book. Okay, so what do we have? So we have the expansion rates are giving us a sigma of 0.8 with this error bar. The cluster analysis I told you before is giving us about 0.82 if we assume the traditional model is correct. And now with this latest uh, SPT result, they are claiming a sigma of 0.77 with this uncertainty assuming the same traditional model. So right now, actually, these are all consistent with each other within these error bars. Uh, and we can expect the uncertainty, certainly for the power spectrum method, to, to improve, at least the measurement. So for now, they're all consistent. Maybe that won't be the case. But basically, we have expansion rate probes being consistent with two separate probes. Okay. Now, if we are, though, going to worry about um, differences between, say, 0.77 and 0.82, for example, there's an important piece to note. Okay, well, first, first, let, me first let me describe the challenges for, for this whole endeavor. And then I'll talk about the detail. So obviously, we see that the whole issue is understanding the cluster access physics. That's constraining how we can constrain this model. In my opinion, I think that it will be easier to use counts of massive clusters because we have many different handles with which we can measure their mass. And in particular, we can use weak lensing, even though these, these, this technique is extremely difficult. Uh, it is one of the only techniques where we can actually get a handle on how much non-thermal pressure there really is. Because X-ray and SC techniques are only probing the thermal pressure. So the idea is to calibrate the scaling relation with a smaller sample of, weak cl of clusters with careful weak lensing masses, like a sample of 30 or 50 clusters. And then the idea is once you've got that calibration, you understand that bias and that scaling relation, the idea is still the SC effect is one of the most promising techniques to find the clusters and actually have the small scatter uh, with mass. But there are a number of other techniques one could use, strong lensing, velocity, dispersion, et cetera. And actually, for people who are interested in learning about cluster astrophysics, this is a very rich time to get into the field. But how well have the weak lensing masses uh, been uh, understood in terms of uh, their own biases? Because they're quite prone to projection effects. So as far as the, OK, excellent question. So as far as the projection effect issue is, I think that the uncertainty for individual clusters is on the order of 30%. That's the number I've been hearing. So the idea is that if you, if that the addition, the idea is that if you have a sample of 30 or 50, that uncertainty is, is a scatter. It's not a bias in the mass. So projection effects should have a 30 percent scatter, but you can always have um, extra stuff along the line of sight, or you can have an underdense region along the line of sight. And weak lensing is always measured with respect to your background. So even though the scatter is large for weak lensing, of all the of all the techniques, it should have, in principle, the smallest bias with mass. Whereas strong lensing techniques actually have a, a triaxial bias, where if your halo is triaxial, you'll tend to find strong lensing on two more. And then these three techniques are sensitive to. Well, this is only measuring thermal pressure and, and dynamic pressure. What I'm referring mm -hmm. to, of course, is the um, curious situation we have with the 
blanket for 20% non-thermal pressure on every halo. And then this other one said, let's do the same, but have the non-thermal pressure with some radial dependence, so we have more non-thermal pressure gaps. But in all senses, I mean, this model, in all senses, they've got gas painted on, and this one is different because it's building up in first place. But, but the other thing that I know is all is so much that uh, people are using yeah. in, their, um, in their models. So they were taking into account the components, and they were making use of the static thermal component. So the way we treated it, and we know I think, is we put in some uncertainty for that hydrostatic balance that uh, I think would reflect itself by moving those red, uh, those red points on the right. 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 And so, um, and so in other words, the, the data is uncertain because the physics of the model is being put into the, the, um, the, what I'm going to So in other words, please don't read this as any of these models are wrong or right. All of these masses are hydrostatic masses assuming the thermal pressure is all there. Okay. So now with ACT, what we try to do is get a handle on this in a different way. So ACT can also observe the equatorial region. Uh, it also is overlapping stripe 82. So we had 148 gigahertz data overlapping stripe 82. And what we decided to do was to stack LRGs in the ACT data. So it's a Sloan, there's a whole sample of thousands of LRGs, and we basically they were binned in four different luminosity bins. And we stacked all the LRGs in a given luminosity bin, and then we measured what the SC signal was. So, so here's the measurement of the SC signal with the error bars, but now the trick comes into relating the luminosity bin of the LRGs. And so this has been done in a variety of ways. So this first way that I show, they calibrated the LRG luminosity to mass by using stacked weak lensing masses. So they basically stacked the optical masses around the LRGs and measured the weak, stacked weak lensing signal. And so that's reflected in these masses here with <coughs> uncertainty still about 20 to 35 percent. So they're still quite low. And this solid line is this traditional model that I've been telling you about. But now to see how things get more complicated, these black points and the red points are using a different way to measure, to relate LRG luminosity to mass. They're using this halo bias technique. And this was from a paper in 2005, Seljek et al., and this is from a Reed et al. paper. And um, actually, I've been talking more to people, I think, so obviously you can see there's a difference here and here. I think that this one also assumes a different cosmology than the read paper. And, and um, in any point, the point to take away from this is these optical mass estimates are quite, are quite uncertain. And so more movement needs to be done to use that technique to understand the scale model. But now, Let's talk about the new Planck results, which have added sort of an additional twist to everything. So Planck had a series of five papers come out in January on the SC effect. And this paper was describing the scaling relation between SC flux and an X-ray derived mass. And the agreement is quite good. So that basically means that over a very large scale of masses, the X-ray signal is agreeing with the SC signal. Okay. Great. That's what we expect. However, what's puzzling is that with the SC optical scaling relations, what Planck did was stack the 13,000 clusters found optically with the max BCG catalog. And when they did that, they, so they stacked in richness pins. Richness is basically measuring how many galaxies there are in the cluster. And there's a relation to tie that to mass using the and when they did that, they found that the measured SZ signal, when they stacked as a function of redshift, was lower than, than what is predicted. And so to first order, you would think, well, maybe there was some bias in how this optical mass was measured. Maybe there was a weak lensing bias, because basically uh, people stacked on richness and then, and then used weak lensing to calibrate the mass respect. However, the interesting twist comes when you use a subsample that was just selected from x-rays. This is an extra, essentially like an x-ray bright sample of optical cluster. And you do the exact same analysis, and there the discrepancy goes away. So what this suggests is that there is no overt bias in the weak lensing mass estimate. 
wrong is that there's two separate populations of galaxy groups, galaxy groups and clusters, even out to very high mass clusters. And this is something like 8 times 10 to the 14 solar masses down to the group scale. So basically, it's suggesting that there's a whole population of clusters that you don't see in the extra end of the S. And, and if that's the case, that's that's sort of surprising because both the X-ray techniques and the optical techniques are measuring the same cosmology from their sample, the same signal value. If X-ray is really missing a whole sample of clusters, their signal H should be five to twelve. And uh, so, and and this would also start with, you know, submission. So also, if we're missing a whole sample of clusters, then that's problematic for both X-ray and SD service. However, um, the next BCG people are confused because they say that in their paper they tested the calibration of off of X-rays and, and they didn't see this. So basically, I don't know what's going on, and I think a lot of people are not sure what's going on. So um, this type of analysis acts tenderly. Yes. 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 Sorry. So uh, but still, it seems that the the slope of the model is different from the slope of the data. Uh, so the, the blue points seem to be... Here, in this part or here? Yeah, yeah part? here. So, so uh, people say that the discrepancy goes away, but above N200 or uh, 30 or 40, all the, the blue data points are stable systematically above the red data points. And uh, below that, they are sitting below the red data points. So it seems... And, and if you look at the previous plot, it's mm -hmm. even more obvious that the slopes are different. It's not... Uh, so Eduardo Rosso claims that he can explain the difference of the slope due to selection effects. And so, so he thinks that, that this difference in the slope actually straightens out or you do things correctly. And that what really is going on is just an offset in the normalization. But that's that's from him. So he says that um, this is essentially that you've got a selection bias because you preferentially choose things that scatter into your sample that have a higher richness. So he's saying that that's, that's maybe what this difference in the slope from the top. So he says the slope flattens out, but you're still left with this discrepancy that he, you know, he doesn't understand. And I don't know. is 
instead of what we had done before was slightly different. We did a slack, stack LRG sample, but we actually have these MACPs to be clustered in our song data, in the strike region. So, so we can actually do this. Somebody just needs to do it. And then we'll see if we see the same thing. Right? Okay. Yeah, it's just that 13,000 is a lot to stack on. That's correct. But I, I think the latest paper, Lyman was passing around, there are at least like six, there are some samples with at least 6,000 plus the Something like that. By the way, so I don't know. We'll find out when it goes to happen. So anyway, Axe has now observed over three years in the south and in the equator, 1,000 square degrees. And we're pushing to get um, a noise limit of at least 25 microphones per minute. Now, after poll has been funded by NSF for a three-year survey to begin in 2013, after poll is supposed to have two to three times more sensitive detectors with polarization capability, and the survey should be over 4,000 square degrees with 20 microphone noise, and we're talking about 1,000 questions. But I think that this, the, the main strength to me of the survey is also the overlap with the optical survey. So um, SDS3 and BOSS. And so, so BOSS is basically going to be a spectroscopic survey of millions of galaxies, and it's already taken data. And then it's supposed to overlap with the proposed weak lensing survey of 2,000 to 8,000 square degrees, overlapping the optical region using the new hyper-supreme antenna on Subaru. And so the hurdle for these surveys is certainly um, one survey hurdle is confirming the candidates and then, of course, getting spectroscopic redshift. So now if we overlap with BOSS, then we'll have spectroscopic cluster redshifts for a vast um, percentage of our sample. And then we can, you know, Subaru is some of the best, uh, and some of the best ground-based imaging for we find. Probably better than dark energy survey will be. And so the idea is then to calibrate our SCC along the two finding masses. And then to talk about more things in the future, if we keep wanting to think ahead, there is the CCAT telescope that this is the vision for it in the Atacama Desert. Uh, it will also have capabilities to observe an SC wavelengths and will also go far up into the infrared. It has uh, should have a um, 20 arc minute field of view, and it should have capabilities of covering hundreds of square degrees, but this time at half arc minute resolution, uh, with better sensitivity than even ACT or, or F-Pole or SP-3. 
it was laid down according to the gravitational potential in order to stay? Um, I think that we, we had all the particles, and the nation, all the particles had a certain mass, and it was laid down in using that particle mass distribution. So. Yeah, but I understood that there was actually gravitational potential that was used, um, and that that allowed you to do asymmetry. Yeah. Um, and so what that means is that you must have coded the um, profile of the pressure profile uh, that were put in as a function. I mean, we're doing this now, and I just wondered what was done. Because nobody clocks this, and it's pretty hard to do, which is essentially pressure against five. Five being the stuff that the pressure is being used to Yeah, because that means I like the technique a lot because it's actually making use of a detailed gravitational potential. And you don't want to have it too tied to the dark matter right. because obviously the dark matter is not the whole story here. Right. And right. 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 Bias, but probably it's a little bit better as gravitational potential. But it's not right. completely true, but it would be at least better to do. And so I like the idea, but I just wondered exactly how it was done. So I, I think as much has been described in Paul's uh, Bode paper, it's all the description that I would know about. And I think this is a good idea that we should actually 